Okay, yeah. so I'd like to uh, welcome Romain. Um, Romain's got a Diploma d'Ingenieur in Natural Sciences from the ESPCI Paris, as well as an MSc in Optics and Photonics and an MRes in the Chemical Biology of Health and Disease and a PhD in Biophotonics from the Imperial College of London. Um, as a postdoc, he's worked on super resolution microscopy techniques at Cambridge University, and he's now a postdoctoral fellow at the MRC Laboratory for Molecular Cell Biology based at University College London. Um, his current research interests include the development of optical and analytical tools for biological microscopy at multiple scales. So over to you, Romain. Right, so thank you very much. Um, so just before I start, I'd like to really thank Lee and Pip and everyone at OROX for, for, or, for organizing this fantastic conference and also to, for inviting me, for having me over and giving me the chance to, to present a little bit of our work. Um, so, without further ado, what, what I'll do is I'll introduce you directly to our new platform uh, for the development use of deep learning for microscopy. And so, how we've called this is we've called it zero cost deep learning for microscopy, zero cost DL4 MIC. Um, but what I should highlight about this, about our contribution to this field, is and we are not building new neural networks, new deep learning approaches, new tasks. What we've built here is really a framework that will be able to integrate a lot of the recent developments in, um, in deep learning, the, the, the new networks, the new tasks that have been developed by uh, fantastic people all the way across computer science and biology, right? But our, our perspective or our objective in this case was really to develop a platform that will make the use, the training, and the control, the quality control of deep learning approaches completely hassle-free, right? So really approachable and really practical for, uh, for a lot of people in the, in the biomedical research field, right, essentially. Okay, so um, if you have been a little bit overwhelmed by the, the vast quantity of papers coming out, uh, in the recent years in uh, deep learning applied to microscopy, you're probably not the only one, right? There's been an enormous amount of uh, publications in, uh, in fully peer-reviewed papers, also tons of it in, in preprints at the moment. This, there's been really a huge boom of those applications in the past three or four years, right? And so what we see, what you can see as well from this very small, non-exhaustive snapshot of, of a handful of papers that have, that have come up um, is a lot of it comes from computer science, right? So there's fantastic computer scientists out there that are developing and pushing the boundaries of what we can do with uh, deep learning nowadays, right? But let, let's, take a, let's take a small step back and let's think, or let's look back at what's created and what originated this deep learning revolution. So the, the actual idea about, of deep learning and your network in particular is not a new idea at all. It's, it comes already back from, uh, from the 50s, back in the days where uh, computers would, would fill up a whole room. And the, it, but at the time, the idea of using um, bio-inspired or, or say brain circuitry inspired type of analysis architecture was kind of a mathematical oddity at the time, right? It seemed very impractical and people didn't really necessarily see the advantage of it. So that's only uh, across the following decades that a lot of the math got developed and these, uh, these approaches of neural networks became suddenly a lot more practical, right? Because they became possible, they became feasible and they became tractable. Um, then in, in the early 2000s, this whole thing actually became suddenly a real possibility through the availability and the, the, the high performance of gra graphical processing units, so GPUs, that, 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 became, that really made um, these approaches really much more efficient than they would have been uh, through parallelization or very efficient parallelization of um, of the computation required for, the, for these. Uh, then uh, we started seeing a number of seminal work that really made a, a clear point about the potential of deep learning. And one of which, uh, 
has really been central in the field is the um, development of AlexNet in 2012, which, um, which came at a contest, an image classification contest more specifically, um, and that really, really outperformed the competition at this contest, right? They came and they completely blasted everyone um, out of the way. And that really, really, really showed, and they were the first to provide a GPU accelerated neural network at the time. And so that, that clearly showed the potential uh, of uh, deep learning to, for image classification in this particular case, right? So to be able to label an image as what it is or what a human would be able to, uh, to, um, to classify, really, really, that, that made it really powerful. Then a little bit closer to home, a little bit closer to uh, bioimage analysis. A few years later, um, a, a group uh, headed by Olaf Wallenberger uh, in 2015 created units. Um, and this unit is actually a brand new architecture of neural network that was really, uh, really specifically designed to do uh, image to image type of analysis. So now what you can do is take uh, just like here, just like in this example, take a, an electron micrograph, right, and obtain uh, image segmentation out of it, right? And that really showed the research field, uh, th some of the, the, that really showed the research field how powerful deep learning could be uh, in this case. Um, a little bit later, um, it was clear through, for instance, AlphaGo, uh, that deep learning was here to stay and was here to really change the way we uh, the way we do everything, right? And so in the following years, 2018, all the way up to today, um, as I said earlier, there's been a huge development in um, new architectures, new tasks, new networks, new, uh, new framework, etc., and new compatibilities with uh, more classical uh, bioimage analysis. So that's been a really huge uptake uh, from, from the community here. And so these are obviously a non-exhaustive list list of um, of of some of the work that have come up in recent years. Um, but what's the fuss about, right? There's lots of it, but why and um, how come it's it's important? So let's take a quick look at how classical algorithms work to start with. So in a classical algorithm development, um, what you typically do is you start from an image, let's say here, an image that's noisy, and you want to obtain a denoised version of this image. What would you, would, what you would typically do is you would uh, very carefully handcraft an algorithm that would take this image and then extract the information that's, um, uh, that's contained into it to be able to obtain a denoised image out of it, right? So you'll spend a lot of time handcrafting uh, what the algorithm does. That could be some Gaussian blur, that could be some more um, more complex algorithm, but you, you, what you get out of it is the denoised image. In the case of deep learning, the approach is absolutely and radically different. In this case, what you start with is a so-called training data set. And this, what this training data set is made of is a, a set of images that are input, right? What you start with right here on the left and a set of equivalent images that are output that are the images that you wish to actually obtain from those images. So those could be sets of images that you've acquired with low illumination power to high illumination power, for instance, right? In the case of low SNR to high SNR. And so what, what you do in this case is you now feed those training data set into a blank uh, a neural network here. And you, you basically tell it, right, learn from those examples how you could then create a model that will be able to perform that denoising task, right? And so you, you set it to, to run its training on its own and to actually iterate its own parameters until it performs well at uh, reproducing the denoised images from the noisy images. And so what you obtain out of this is not denoised images, right? But what you obtain is a trained model, a model that can now be used to actually take some uh, new unseen noisy images and produce the equivalent 
um, denosed image as a model prediction, right? And so that's really powerful because now you don't need to think so much, uh, well, you don't need to handcraft, I should say, um, the the algorithm that goes in there, the the, the parameters and how uh, the the images is is transformed to obtain the denoise image is led to the neural network to train on its own, right? And so that's really powerful for two particular reasons. One of which is that um, it can approximate any model provided it's given enough examples, provided it can learn from that training data set. So what what I've what I've shown you here in the case of deep learning is that they, I didn't um, I didn't tell you I didn't give a restriction in terms of what you can give as training data as input and output. So you the, you you can see immediately the versatility of deep learning, right? So that can do lots of different tasks. That can perform lots of different um, image analysis uh, as long as the training data set is. Um, <clears throat> is built properly, right? And so that makes it extremely powerful from that point of view. And the second point, which is important here, is that it can massively outperform classical algorithms. And so the two examples I've given you to you earlier in the in the in the later timeline I've shown you was AlexNet in the case of image classification and UNet in the case of image segmentation that really outperform the the classical algorithms in their respective context. So, in deep learning, um, now from what, what I've shown you, hopefully it's absolutely clear that it's all about training, right? And so let's take a, let's take a quick look at what, what, what happens during training. Deep learning works so well in the specific cases where it's, where, in which it's trained because they typically embed structural priors. So what do I mean by this? So let's take a quick look at this beautiful example from one of Myrna's, um, <clears throat> one of Myrna's review on this, uh, which I really, really like. And so let's take here a quick look at the top row. These are just a ground truth images of different shapes. And then right below it, a sparse sampling of those same shapes. And so the idea now is how could we train a neural network to be able to start from those sparse sampling images and go back to the ground truth images. It's essentially uh, similar to a denoising uh, algorithm here, right? So what happens is say, for instance, you actually train a neural network, but only on rectangles. What you'll see is that the neural network will uh, consistently find re uh, rectangles everywhere, right? Everywhere in the, in the images, disregarding what the original uh, <clears throat> ground truth structure were. Right, so it's embedded into its learning the um, the idea that those images are made up of rectangles. And similarly, if you train it on triangles, then you'll find triangles everywhere. Right, so that's really important to to understand what you feed the algorithm with at the training stage, because that's absolutely clear here. Here's how, how things will look like on real data set on the right. And so these are data from a very close collaborator, Christoph Spahn from uh, from um, from Frankfurt, and so what we're looking at here is at a denoising algorithm called CARE, a deep learning algorithm called CARE. Um, and what we've done here is we've denoised uh, so low SNR images right here of Philopodia, right? So they're, they're life fact labeling, <clears throat> and so we've used uh, that CARE algorithm to denoise these and obtain those predictions. And so you see right here in the middle. Uh, the ground truth, the equivalent ground truth image that was not seen during training. And uh, the uh, CARE actually does a very good job at reconstructing the highest in our images. So you can see the comparison here. But what happens if you now take a neural network that was the same neural network, but trained with different data and trained in this case with TOM20 data. So with data that were um, that were built from uh, mitochondrial labeling, right? And so what you see right here is that now that we use the wrong model, or the, a model that was trained with the wrong type of data set, the, the structure looks fairly similar, but if we look very closely, actually the, the, um, the reconstruction is full of artifacts, is full of issues. It doesn't look anything like the highest SNR 
initial image, right? So that's a real issue there. And so the, the, the take home message from this slide is that it is essential to train on your own data or on very well understood data for deep learning to perform reliably, right? And that's absolutely clear from what we've just seen just now. Um, but at that stage, there is actually a real bottleneck to, to, to this is because training on your network can actually feel like performing some maintenance on the International Space Station for some of us, right? So what, what, what you see here is actually Michael Hopkins uh, a NASA astronaut doing some actual maintenance on uh, on the ISS, right? And the comparison here to me um, is is the following: is that to perform training of deep learning um, of deep learning networks at the moment, it is really necessary to understand both the hardware, the software, the install, the dependencies, and the to have a very good understanding of this whole architecture to be able to uh, run and retrain uh, different networks. Our approach or our objective with the work that I'm presenting today is to, to make those things a lot, a lot more streamlined, a lot more accessible, and um, so that they don't feel like re uh, maintaining the International Space Station. So what I'm going to be talking to you about is therefore our um, our platform called Zero Cost DL for MIG. And so let's assume that you have a computer. I will assume that you have a computer because all of you are watching me online today. Um, and so you have all of your data on your computer, your training data and your new data that you want to actually uh, uh, study and get the output from. <clears throat> So you've also decided what kind, of, um, uh, what kind of task you want to perform. Let's say you've chosen you want to do uh, denoising and therefore your training data has been curated accordingly. The first step of, um, of the platform is to upload all of this data to a Google Drive. So everything goes is pushed out on the cloud. So none of the computation will occur on your local machine. The second thing is uh, we provide so-called notebooks, which are basically a list of instruction uh, that, will, that will help the cloud computing to understand what it needs to do. And so we provide these and they are, they're, they're part of the framework. Then the second step is to actually connect with a second Google, um, uh, Google component called Google Colab, and that will be able to uh, interpret the instruction from the notebook and uh, perform the different tasks on the, on the training data and on the new data. What's really essential about um, Colab, what's really useful in our case, is that Colab can actually provide virtual machines in the cloud that are uh, physically connected to extremely powerful uh, high-end GPUs um, where you can actually perform the, um, uh, the neural network, the neural network task. And so that creates, this whole environment creates the high computational uh, capabilities that are required to do all of this. So at that stage, once all of your data and your computation is, is set up in the cloud, the, you can perform the network training in the cloud similarly, right? And it's all taken care of by Google Colab. Um, the next step is to take the, um, <clears throat> the train model that we've just obtained from the training and to actually perform the prediction from the new data, which, is a, which gives you the, the, the results, the result data, which is what you're actually after in the end. And the very last step, also important, is to actually download and get all of your data back along with the train model that you've just obtained from the training data. And having this train model also allows you to rerun um, as many predictions as you want through the same, um, through the th same loop if you wanted, right? And so there's a number of real advantages in our opinion there. Is th this platform provides, first of all, a, a free cloud-based access to GPU, right? So this whole virtual machine is set up in the cloud. You don't need to have any specific hardware or software in your local machine. Second, we've, we've built a, a simple user interface that requires no coding whatsoever to be able to do all of this. And I'll give you, I'll show you a quick example of how this looks like in a second. And last but not least, 
it's in a single platform. Uh, it provides training, prediction, and quality control on uh, on what's been happening to your data, right? And so what you see here is a stock image of a happy biologist, which is what we're actually after in this case, right? So here's how the web page actually looks like if you actually gonna, if you would open one of those notebooks in Google Colab, um, I will actually take you right here, reconnect right here to, um, <clears throat> to my web browser. So what you see here is I'm, physically onto Safari. So that's my web browser. And I've opened this notebook. This notebook is actually a Stardist. I'll, I'll introduce this in a couple of slides again. And so what Stardist does is that it does um, nuclei segmentation from images. And so what you see here is that it's all about just following the streamlined uh, structure of the notebook. And in a few places, you can check your GPU access. Then you can install, uh, connect to your Google Drive by just playing these different cells, install the different dependencies and um, all the different um, components that are required for this. Then there's a component for training, a component for evaluating the model right here. I've done that just a couple of minutes before joining you online here. And so what you see here is loss functions and then some error mapping as well onto, um, onto some test data set as well. Right, so that's as simple as clicking onto those cells to execute some bits of codes and get some um, natural and understanding, uh, understandable output, right? So, what are the tasks that we've currently implemented uh, within, um, within our platform, right? As I said, it, it integrates a lot of different networks. And what we've done is we've actually taken a lot of networks that are state-of-the-art uh, image analysis at the moment from computer scientists, from, uh, from the deep learning, the wider deep learning community. And so we've implemented three main tasks in this case so far. Uh, one is image segmentation. Uh, and then we've done, uh, we've implemented Stardist and UNIT as two different uh, networks. We've implemented some denoising algorithms, care, noise to void. And we've also implemented something called artificial labeling which is label-free prediction or FNET. And so I'll, I'll be telling you a little bit at the end about what this means. So, image segmentation. So I've shown you UNET earlier. Uh, we've re-implemented UNET for image segmentation here shown in the case of uh, electron micrograph uh, image segmentation. And all the data, I should highlight that, all the data that you will see from there on were obtained through our platform and with um, data that we provide as example data to perform the training and the, um, and the predictions, right? So what you see here is UNET seems to work really, really well on obtaining uh, membrane segmentation. The second kind of image segmentation that is very common is nuclei segmentation from, uh, from fluorescence images. <clears throat> and so we've implemented um, a model, sorry, a network called Stardist. Um, and you, you can see those, uh, the, the publication of, those, of, this, um, of this neural network right here. And so that really um, uh, segments, uh, segments out the, the nuclei very efficiently. And so there's no reason why you can't apply this directly onto movies. Here, what we're looking at is cell migration, um, cell migration study where we pick up the individual uh, nuclei and we can follow them over time. We can actually see how one nuclei, uh, one nucleus becomes two during cell division and so on. Right, so that can be extremely powerful. Second type of task is image denoising. So what we've implemented first was CARE, so content aware image restoration, which, is, which has been a really a, a seminal work in the, in the field of, uh, in, in our field of bioimage analysis. And <clears throat> so what you see right here is similarly a very, um, a very clear example of how a, a low, a low SNR image can be transformed into a high SNR image through this approach. So there's no reason why you can't apply this to a, a movie as well once you've got it nicely trained. And so what I wanted to show you here as an example is that uh, this is uh, the raw data on the top left is actually data obtained from uh, structured illumination microscopy, from SIM microscopy. And you might be able to, to pick up some, um, 
uh, some usual uh, sim noise or sim artifacts uh, that are present in there. And that was actually um, gotten rid of in the model output that we can obtain from uh, from the neural network in this case. So that can take uh, that can take out a lot of different uh, noise components out of this out of our data. Second type of, um, of network that we've also implemented for the purpose of denoising is noise to void. Also extremely powerful, as you can see here, from a low, low SNR to a very high SNR. And so you can also apply this to movies, of course. Uh, but what's really important about this model is that the, the, the authors have implemented this in such a clever way that the, at the training stage, it doesn't even require the output equivalent images um, to be able to train itself. It, it does this in, in lots of very clever ways. Uh, so that's also very powerful in that sense. Um, so here's what, what I'm gonna show you here is same network, noise to void, but now applied to a full um, 3D time course, um, actually super resolved in this case because that's an instance in microscope. Uh, of mitochondrial um, dynamics in this case, right? So it's mitotracker. And so that seems that, that works really, really well in our hands. So I promised to you that I was going to tell you a little bit about artificial labeling. So what do we mean by that? So let's start from a very silly idea. Um, here's, here's my silly idea for you. If let's, let's assume you've got a, a multi-channel uh, data set that you have where you've uh, You've started, you've acquired some cells, some images, <clears throat> and you've both acquired uh, on the same field of view the, um, the bright field images, what you see on the left, and the, the equivalent um, fluorescence images of here, say, TOM20 immunolabeling, right? And so you've got those two modalities on the same field of view. Um, what would happen? if you now feed these as input and output respectively to a neural network, right? That sounds like a really silly idea. Those are, those are completely different modalities. But from the perspective of deep learning, it's not a silly idea at all, actually, because as long as you have enough features, enough information that you might or might not even be able to see by eye, then the neural network will be able to um, to pick this up and reconstruct the equivalent uh, fluorescence image as an output. And that's actually what those guys have uh, very, very elegantly demonstrated um, in, a in a paper from a couple of years ago, where they've actually taken bright field images to reconstruct pseudo fluorescence images. Um, and so what this means and what, what, what we've re-implemented this into our framework. And so here what I'm showing to you is um, some data that we've obtained from exactly what I've described to you, starting from bright field images. Those are the input images, and we're able to obtain model outputs that are pseudo fluorescence images of a mitochondrial marker from those cells. And so that's extremely that's that's really um, a game changing in my view because what this means is that you can obtain the equivalent of fluorescence images from your bright field. And there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to train a neural network to take that same bright field image and extract lots of different fluorescent equivalent markers, right? And that's what the, the um, original, um, the original uh, authors actually did, is they, they, they checked a lot of different uh, fluorescent markers in this case, right? So that, that's, that opens up so many po possibilities in my mind. So, uh, just to, uh, to give you a quick recap before wrapping up, um, what I've presented to you is a framework that we called Zero Cost TL4 MIC. And so that has uh, this architecture. And that is one important component of this is that that is completely work from home compatible, right? Especially in those times of uh, COVID lockdown, right? Being able to work from home and maybe try uh, try new approaches that, that you've been wanting to find a time um, to try that out, um, now's a good time. Second is we've actually, we're all about open source and we've created 
a fully documented GitHub uh, repository that will uh, help you at every step of the way to be able to get this up and running uh, for you for your own purpose. And uh, <clears throat> on top of this, so we've currently implemented three different um, three different tasks. So as I said, segmentation, denoising, and artificial labeling. But that's an ever growing. Um, that's an ever growing. Um, that's an ever growing system, essentially, platform where we integrate lots of new, um, lots of new tasks all the time, and there's actually already quite a few things in the pipeline as we speak, right? So watch this space. And um, just one more thing, we've actually also wrapped all of this up into a bioarchive paper uh, that is currently available online and where you'll find a, a complete description of what this is about, uh, how to understand it, and, and what we see the advantages are, right? So uh, again, watch this space. And now just to finish off, um, I've got a handful of people to, to acknowledge. Uh, who you see here on top here is uh, essentially the core team of this work, right? We've got Lucas, Johanna, uh, Christoph, Guillaume, and Ricardo. Um, and um, so we've, uh, thanks to that team, we've really built uh, uh, this, uh, in my mind, really, really great framework. And we've really built something that, 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 that makes deep learning a lot more approachable. Um, and to be able to prove this, actually, we've, we've collaborated very closely with lots of beta testers that have, that have helped us develop something sensible and really appropriate for for the field, and so we've got a lot of collaborators um, from um, from Germany, from uh, Newcastle, from all over the world. Uh, we've also collaborated directly with the original developers of some of those networks, from Stardust, Noise to Void, Care, and so on, uh, from San Francisco, from Dresden, um, and they've really supported our work uh, wonderfully to be able, to, and we wouldn't have been able to do any of this without their help, and so. More generally as well, I, I really want to, to send my thanks to the, the wider deep learning community for making all of their work uh, and their development completely open source for us to be able to take all of this on board and making them available through our platform, right? And so the, here's a very, very limited uh, list of, of, of papers that we've, we've inspired, that has inspired the work and from where we've taken a lot of the neural networks from. And so uh, I'd like to finish off by thanking the, um, <clears throat> the funding body that have supported this work. And I'd like to thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. That was a really good talk. Um, it was really great to hear about the, the history about how deep learning has evolved. And I really like the artificial labeling technique. It's really impressive. Um, so I look forward to having a play with uh, with some of your example data. Um, there's just one one question come through. Um, it's about when you push the data to the Google Drive and to Colab. Um, how confident are you that that data is secure? What what sort of um, mm -hmm. is the process in, involved in that? So, of course, um, Google does not guarantee or does not really tell you uh, about what it does with your data once it's on Google Drive. Um, so of course, that's, that's a clear limitation of cloud-based, of this kind of cloud-based approaches. Um, there are a number of other cloud-based repositories from which the data could be collected. We've not implemented this yet, but that's something we're thinking about. In our mind, uh, all of our data is actually made completely open source, and we don't necessarily have this concern specifically um, because we're all about sharing the data that we've been using for our framework. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I understand. I understand. And uh, what what do you see as the future for for deep learning? What's what's coming next? This is obviously very very cool and cutting edge. So the it's I would I would say it's very difficult to to foresee um, what the future will bring out of this. And it's not uncommon for people to compare this to, uh, to back in the 80s or, or the, 
when when people started discovering the internet, right? And no one saw really how it would fundamentally change the way we even live our life, right? Beyond just our research and our work. And I, I, I think this comparison is fairly accurate. That is difficult to really foresee. But some of the applications that I've shown you, and in particular, as you highlighted nicely, artificial labeling really kind of, in my mind, really drills a hole through the preconception that we have about what image analysis can do, right? Suddenly that opens up so many more possibilities. Mm -hmm. And um, this, there's a number of brilliant scientists that, are, that have, well, there's basically a couple of very good re reviews that have really highlighted some of the fundamental work that this will be able to achieve. And I'm really looking forward to see what happens next. Fantastic. Well, let's let's uh, watch this space and see see where it, um, what develops in the future. So, mm -hmm. thank you once again for a brilliant talk. Um, I'm sure people will get in touch with you if they have any more questions about the technique, and obviously look up the the online resources and and uh, have a have a go. So, thank you very much. We'll wrap up there and move on to the next uh, speaker. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Pip and uh, Lee and everyone at Orox. Bye -bye. Brilliant. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye.